see Dr. Landy there. What do you think, Howard? Should we start? Um, yeah, may as well. It's a couple minutes after seven. Sounds good. We, we appreciate your giving this talk this morning. As, as, as unpleasant a topic as it may be. That's, and that's exactly right. And I think that's why, um, just like complications, it's important that we talk about this particular issue because uh, there's that expression about how things happen. Um, so this is, a, this is an encore presentation of a, a talk I uh, gave a few years ago. Um, I think it resonates with all of us uh, in the department uh, uh, because at some point, nearly every single one of us is gonna find ourselves in the witness chair. And um, like many things that uh, in neurosurgery, we, there is no formal training for it. We just have to learn it on the fly. Um, so I thought this would be a good topic for us to discuss. Uh, and I call this talk Lessons from the Witness Chair because uh, this is uh, lessons from the school of hard knocks, as it were. Um, by way of disclosures, uh, I, I am not an attorney and I have no formal legal training. There are colleagues of ours who, uh, as a result of the trauma of this process, have gone on to become attorneys and represented doctors. And um, I haven't done anything quite that drastic, uh, but, it, but after my first experience with this, uh, you know, I thought it was best that I learn as much as I can about it. So uh, over the years, I've given a, a fair number of depositions. This is probably from three or four years ago. Uh, so the number is well over 40 by now. Um, there are many people in the department who have a lot more experience than I. I'm happy to report, and I would encourage you uh, to ask folks like Dr. Levy and Dr. Green and Dr. Harris. And I'm not going to name names, but there are a lot of us, because of our time in the department, can, who can share their experience and their wisdom. Um, so uh, what we, we'll try to do today is to talk a bit about uh, the realities of malpractice in neurosurgery and why it's not something you can use the ostrich approach uh, uh, i.e. put your head in the sand. Um, we'll talk about the National Practitioner Data Bank and what it means to you. And, um, uh, and then we'll talk about the process of giving a deposition. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's, uh, this is something that it, at some point, some formal um, uh, time with uh, uh, the risk management department would be of value to everybody. The problem is that their perspective is not the same as ours. Um, so I think, uh, I think we can learn from each other uh, as well as we can learn more formally from the attorneys. So the realities of malpractice, right? Malpractice in Miami is, uh, is like surviving hurricane season, right? This is September 16th, just about a month ago. Uh, that's us at the frowny face. And this is what neurosurgical practice is like, right? You come to work every day and all this stuff swirls around you. Um, and every single clinical interaction, no matter how insign insignificant it may be, uh, is potentially um, at an opportunity for a claim, depending on not so much the outcome, but the interaction. And I think I can't stress that enough. Um, and our strategy in surviving this as, uh, as neurosurgeons in busy practice is you can't, uh, you can't avoid seeing the, the, the children or family members of attorneys or attorneys themselves. That's not a reasonable strategy. You can't practice defensive medicine, but you can be smart. Uh, and, and I think there's a strategy to that, um, which uh, I, I refer to this book a lot. Um, anybody who's worked with me has been tortured by, by uh, this book. Uh, this book, The Art of War, written by uh, uh, 2,000 years ago by a Chinese warrior and, and Taoist philosopher, contains a lot of these like, life lessons uh, um, expressed in terms of combat and um, and strategy. Uh, and this book was given to me by um, my biochemistry lab instructor. Um, it was mandatory reading for biochemistry lab. Uh, that is along with a book called uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. At least this book, The Art of War, it has a Taoist basis. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance was a completely different book. And someday I'm going to make a talk about that one. Um, but there's a lot of lessons here uh, that can be applied to neurosurgical practice and to day-to-day -day life. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll sprinkle the talk with them. If you've never, if you don't have the book, uh, it's not very big. It's pretty tiny. Uh, they come in paperback. There's lots of translations. Uh, it's kind of, you just put by your bedside and read a few at night before you go to bed. Um, 
So let's begin with the premise uh, that every neurosurgeon gets sued, right? So there is this, there's this fatalistic approach uh, or philosophy about, about um, litigation. Uh, and there is indeed some truth to that. The problem with a fatalistic attitude uh, of, uh, of medical malpractice um, is that many people then assume that there's nothing that can be done to avoid it. And I think that's, you can't ever talk about medical malpractice uh, without first recognizing that it can be avoided. And there are some really simple strategies to avoid that. Um, it isn't possible to avoid all litigation, um, but it is possible to control your risk. And I think, again, there's a, a lot you can say about that. And I think what's better way of summarizing this issue is that um, every neurosurgeon has complications uh, or bad outcomes, uh, but not every neurosurgeon gets sued. Um, and I think if you don't, if you don't embrace that attitude that there are things we can do um, to prevent finding ourselves in a malpractice lawsuit, um, you'll be like your, your adversaries, uh, as, as uh, Sun Tzu uh, points out. Um, so uh, let's start with, the, with the, some background, right? So uh, medical malpractice is an issue for us in neurosurgery. We live uh, in a very litigious state. Um, that's run by trial attorneys, uh, as evidenced by the amendments we have to our state constitution. Um, there's a couple of uh, significant studies that look at the overall risk by specialty, and that's important because we in neurosurgery are one of the highest risk specialties. This is a commonly quoted article from 2011 uh, from the New England Journal, um, and Jenna has written many of these papers. Um, this particular study looked at tort data. So they looked at, at uh, the, the legal literature um, and uh, overlapped the legal literature for, on a state-by-state -state basis to the medical practice literature, um, or I'm sorry, the medical practice data per state. And they divide specialties into two categories, high risk and low risk. And they looked at the dates of 1991 to 2005. Um, and then they did a multivariate analysis to look at the factors that might be associated with risk within a specialty. Um, so a very thoughtful study. You can see it's important to us, published in the New England Journal. Um, and what they showed is that the, um, the claim rate during that period of study uh, was about 7.5%. Um, but the payment rate was much smaller. So there are a lot of claims being filed, um, uh, but there's about... Uh, uh, less than 20% of them ever get paid. So the rate of payment is about 1.6%. And then of course, if you uh, want to figure out who has the highest probability per year of being sued, not surprisingly, it's us in neurosurgery. We can talk about why that may be. It may be our attitudes as neurosurgeons, or it may be the nature of what we do. I actually think it's kind of both. Um, what is interesting is that it had the, that the, the statistical analysis showed that there's clearly no correlation with doctor's age. Um, this idea that there's no correlation with state uh, or the year uh, that is, um, I think, arguable. And I think this next study will show you that the year does make a difference because it's evolved over time. Graphically, what you can see is that the physicians with malpractice claims by specialty as a percent per year, you know, here we are in neurosurgery, right at the very top. Um, we get to be number one uh, with uh, the cardiothoracic surgeons close behind us. Um, so our, our rate is quite high at, uh, here at nearly 20% of neurosurgeons being, having a claim filed against them per year. Um, but the payment data, which is really the important thing, is of interest as well. And uh, one of the interesting things to look is that although the mean payment is about 200 and $75,000 per claim that gets paid. Uh, in neurosurgery, that average payout is much higher. But look at pediatrics, right? The pediatric payment rate is also higher still, and that probably has a lot to do with the types of things that happen in children amplified over the course of their lives. So if, you, if a child is injured by neglect or late diagnosis or mismanagement, the, the payment is calculated out over the course of that child's life. Uh, and if you deal with geriatric neurosurgery, your risk for payment over the course of that 
patient's life is smaller than if you deal with pediatrics, where the risk of payment amplified over the life is much greater. And um, uh, there are some outliers, of course, the, the, the greater than a million dollar settlements. Um, this was the, the, the 2011 study where uh, uh, obstetrics, pathology, anesthesia, and pediatrics were the outliers in the bigger than million dollar claims. I, I can tell you now that neurosurgery has joined that group as well. Um, if, you, if you look at dollars at, as payment per specialty in a graphic way, here's, here's pediatrics, right? So uh, what you see is that pediatrics, the number of payments, the number of suits are, are much smaller in pediatrics, but the maximum payouts are much greater because of that application over life. So if you really want to get yourself into a, a practice that puts you at, at tremendous liability and risk, be a pediatric neurosurgeon. Um, so when you, there's this idea that uh, as we get older, and now that I'm in that group, um, our risk of being sued goes up. And, and that is not true as evidenced by the data from this 2011 study your risk of having a lawsuit filed against you is higher because you've been exposed to many, many more patients over the years. So your malpractice insurer uh, has this term uh, that applies to people who are new in practice. Uh, you are, quote, naive or have very little risk exposure. You just start in practice, you see your first patient, you see your first 100 patients, but that's 100 patients that are potential claimants against you. But if you've been in practice, for 30 years, there are 30 years worth of patients who have you have seen and cared for over the years, any of whom could claim that you did something to them that resulted in harm and file a suit against you. There is some statute of limitations depending on when the event was discovered. If you divide, this study divided uh, uh, malpractice lawsuits into the two categories of high risk and low risk, and it is true that if you are in a high risk specialty, like I said, neurosurgery, and you practice long enough, let's say you enter practice at about 30 or 33, um, by the time you're 45, you have a greater than 90% chance of having a lawsuit filed against you. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience, that's true. I think it was about age 40 the first time that happened to me. And the longer we're in practice, the more likely it is that you will have a claim against you that doesn't necessarily mean you've had a payment made out on your behalf. Um, and I can talk about what that means at some point um, near the latter half of the talk, but, but those are significantly lower, right? So you, you, almost everybody has a claim against them just because of our exposure. Not everybody has a payment against them. Um, but if you're in a high risk group, your chance of having a payment against you is much greater than if you're in a low risk group. So uh, is there any good news? Um, I think there is. Uh, you know, I, in an effort to refresh this talk, I looked back at the literature um, to see what had come out since that New England Journal article, and this uh, popped up, and this is from uh, JAMA's uh, Internal Medicine. Uh, it's the same group of authors from Harvard. Uh, Jenna here is, was the lead author in that New England Journal article from 2011. And what this study does in contrast to the prior study, which looked at tort data, and payment data and overlap that with medical practice data. This uses data from the National Practitioners Data Bank. Um, and what it showed that between 1992 and 2014, dividing that up into five year blocks, the rate of paid malpractice claims dropped by over 55% cumulative among all of the specialties. And I think that's, um, I think if you asked those of us in practice, we probably, um, that was not intuitive to me. I, I did not uh, expect to see this um, in the literature. And you say you may say, well, it's got nothing to do with neurosurgery, but in reality it does. And one of the more dramatic declines in payments uh, over this time period from the 1992 to 96 period to the 2009 to 2014 period, it's dropped, one of the most significant drops was in neurosurgery where it was almost uh, uh, 60%. So that is a little bit of good news. Um, uh, for all of us. I suspect that has to do with the fact that we now recognize there are things that create risk and exposure for us. Um, and I would like to think that we're doing better, a better job of controlling our risk and exposure. Um, it isn't that we have fewer complications today. 
I think we're just doing a better job of um, communicating what we can accomplish and cannot accomplish um, and controlling the risk associated with those case, uh, those complications. Um, so I mentioned that I would tell you a bit about the National Practitioner Data Bank. I certainly knew nothing about it uh, before I got that envelope in the mail that you saw on the, uh, uh, on the second slide. The National Practitioner Data Bank was established by an act of Congress in 1986. And its mission, as it says here, is to improve health care quality, protect the public, and reduce health care fraud and abuse. And if you read between the lines, what that really means is it's designed to prevent practitioners from moving from state to state without disclosure or discovery of the previous damaging performance. And it kind of makes sense, right? So when you have a state by state licensing system and states don't necessarily share data, you can have bad doctors who go from one state to the next and never disclose their mistakes and continue to be a harm to the public. And so this was an effort well intended as it may be, this was an effort uh, to try to prevent that. Um, this data is uh, not available to the public. It's considered confidential, uh, but it is an important part of credentialing uh, and getting insurance. So the way the National Practitioner Data Bank works um, is that there are obligated reporters to the data bank. And it's a web-based uh, uh, tool where all healthcare entities um, that include state licensing boards, uh, medical malpractice insurers, um, court systems that, that adjudicate malpractice cases, health plans and hospitals are obligated to report to the National Practitioner Data Bank. So if there's a claim or a settlement that exceeds a certain amount, and I believe it's $30,000, that has to be reported to the National Practitioner Data Bank. Those same entities are obligated to query the National Practitioner Data Bank when any practitioner applies to them for coverage, privileges, um, uh, or um, malpractice insurance. The National Practitioner Data Bank uh, can be queried, self-queried. You can ask uh, what, what your history is. Um, and one of the other things that I didn't understand about the National Practitioner Data Bank is that if if you have a settlement against you, uh, you have an opportunity to submit your side of that settlement to the practitioner data bank. But of course, that has to be done within a finite window. Uh, and in my particular case, I knew nothing about the National Practitioner Data Bank. I didn't understand how it worked. I didn't have very good guidance or counsel. Um, and I considered it uh, beneath me to pay attention to such a thing. That's a big mistake uh, because that data stays with you. Um, there is a finite period in which it remains in the data bank. I, I believe it's 10 or 15 years, uh, but that, that data is, is still there many years later. Um, so if something, if a claim is made against you, you can have your attorney or yourself respond in writing and that goes with the report goes to those who are querying the data bank when they ask about you and your history. Um, okay, so um, this, this issue of managing liability and malpractice. Um, and, you know, I started this by saying that uh, it is not, although it is an eventuality that you will have a claim made against you, um, the vast majority of those claims go away. I'm not suggesting it isn't painful, um, but most of them go away because they are unfounded. Um, and there are ways that you can mitigate that risk. And I, I've listed a few of my personal favorites here. Um, and I, I think they may be obvious to all of us, but these are things that we, in our daily interactions with our patients and their families, need to remember. Right, so I'll, I'll be honest, we'll start with the number one, which is to be honest, with patients and yourself. So, you know, when I started in practice and they would say to me, well, Dr. Ragam, how many blah, blah have you done? Well, I've been in practice one month. So I did lots when I was a resident, but you have to be honest about that. And when they ask you your ability to, I'm gonna make stuff up here, to, to coil 
uh, a Basler tip aneurysm, you can quote the literature about your about the success rate and the risk. But what you really need to do is say, here's what the literature says. But my experience is this. And I think it's important to be honest. Now, that has to be weighed against the fact that you also can't spend all of your time frightening your patient with the litany of things that could happen. So there has to be some balance as you do that. Um, and I think it's important that you strike that balance in a way that you're comfortable with and that you're, you provide as much information as the patient or family needs or asks for. I think the other thing that we're also not very good about is, um, and I call this letting the patient speak. If you look at what, uh, what happens when um, a family is upset about an outcome, a great deal of that has to do with communication. And um, most of that is because the family feels that they've not been listened to and, um, uh, or that they, the doctor did not spend the time with them to hear their concerns. So it's, it again sounds like a simple thing to say, um, but one of the ways uh, to mitigate the risk is to be sure that you take the time to listen to people and understand what their concerns may be and their priorities. That's also important medical, right? If you're in a hurry in the office and you don't really listen to what the patient or family is saying, you may miss important clinical clues, which if there's a bad outcome, will then show themselves and be a reflection of the caliber of the care you provided. Um, the, the third one of these here is uh, what I call them, encourage them to seek other opinions. And you know, when I was again, new in practice, um, I, I, I sort of felt like I had uh, uh, the, the the term was athlete scalp, right? From all the people going over my head to go to somebody else. And I started in private practice in Baltimore and everybody wanted to go see Ben Carson. And my response was, well, okay, here's his office number. You go see Dr. Carson. Um, and over the years, what I've evolved to saying to families is, here's what I would do. Um, here's my strategy to manage this. And if you're not comfortable with that, you should take the time to think about it as well as get other opinions. And that's worked well for me over the years. It's a little easier to do that now that I have a lot of gray hair, but I honestly, it, it helped me when I was a new in practice tremendously because occasionally those families would come back and say, Hey, you know, Dr. Reagan, I went to so-and-so and they said, you're doing the right thing. Or they said, Oh no, no, no. This is what should be done. And I, I, I learned from those. And I, I think that helped me uh, tremendously. And the last one is what, is what our health systems harp on more often than not, which is the document thing. And I must say that of all of, of the things that I put on my list here, I'm probably um, the least obsessive about the documenting carefully. There are many people in our department who do a much better job of that than I, and we'll let them uh, add their uh, bias or opinion to this at the end. I think documentation is important, but what I will caution you about is this idea that you can enumerate every possible complication associated with what we do um, in writing on a piece of paper. And if you try to do that and you forget one of them and that one happens, you have just opened yourself up to being sued and losing. Because if you've enumerated this immense list of potential complications and you happen to miss one of those, you cannot use the defense that, well, I discuss complications with the family in advance. It's part of my standard of practice. Uh, I give everybody the list of common complications. And if they need more, I give more. That's my strategy. And I avoid being pigeonholed into listing every possible complication. I list them in general ways, not enumerate them in specifics. And I know there are others who disagree, and I'll, we can discuss this at the end. I've left time at the end for discussion because uh, there's always strong opinions about this topic. So let's get on to this idea of what's a deposition, right? So um, I began this by calling this uh, lessons from the witness chair. And essentially, your exposure to being in the witness chair is going to be to give a deposition, right? That for most of us, um, that's our first exposure to being uh, a witness to anything. 
Um, and let's begin with the basics. So what, what is a deposition and what's its purpose? So um, a deposition is um, a, a legal proceeding, like as it says here, for the purpose of preserving testimony. So something happens, there's a bad outcome, the family's unhappy, they enlist an attorney, they tell them how evil you, you are for what you did to their family member, and then you get something in the mail from the attorney's office saying that so-and-so has enlisted their services to represent them uh, in a potential medical malpractice case, and that you are now mandated to send your records to the attorney's office. And that comes with a summons, um, which is a legal document. And um, of course, when that happens, uh, the first thing you do is you contact your risk management people or your attorney. You do not go to your medical records and start to change them. That's a mistake. Eventually that process works through its steps. And I, I should add some more background about those steps just to add to the pain of this presentation. You'll get a bunch of back and forth where your, your records are sent as well as all of the other people who are named in the suit. And then you'll get a list of questions back from the attorneys called the interrogatories. And you and your attorney will go through those questions that they're asking you in advance of the deposition. So you'll have to answer a bunch of questions about the care you provided and about that patient. And then at the deposition, they are trying to quote, preserve the evidence for future use in the court. And, I'll, and I, I can't stress the preserve the evidence thing enough because what happens at these things is that they are documenting what you say and how you say it. And at the deposition, there's you, your attorney, plaintiff's attorney and the plaintiffs themselves or their representative can be there to stare at you across the table um, and any other interested parties. So an example may be if you're sued along with the hospital and 20 other people, representatives from all of the other people can be there in the room with you. Um, they are not very pleasant experiences the first few times you do them, but it can be a small group or it can be a big group. Um, there are two basic types of depositions. There's the kind where you're the person uh, giving the deposition because you're directly involved in the lawsuit, and that's called discovery or disclosure, and they're trying to discover what you know. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's the other kind, which is an evidentiary deposition where they're collecting evidence because you're the expert or were part of the care provided to that patient, although you're not named in the suit. And that's really uncommon because the practice in here and almost throughout the United States is that when a malpractice claim is made, there is this opportunity to name plaintiffs in the suit. So they name everybody potentially imaginable that could be involved and then drop people as they go because once you make the claim, you can't start adding other claimants in the suit. So they name everybody and drop folks. So if you're involved in the care of somebody and there's a lawsuit, you're almost certainly going to get dragged into it, even if you had nothing to do with it other than, you know, you showed up on rounds with the group. Um, the purpose of the deposition, as I said, is to quote, discover and to and to codify and document your testimony. Why is that important? Because the plaintiff wants to know what care you provided to their client. They wanna use what you say to help their cause and they wanna be able to use that for the benefit of the plaintiff and their case. The purpose of it is to take what you say at that deposition and to commit it into the permanent record and to quote, impeach you, which means to turn it around and use it against you in a trial. That is all so that they can understand what you did and develop a strategy to either discredit you 
or to prove that you did the wrong thing. So the purpose of a deposition is for that plaintiff to document what you did and how you describe it and how you explain what happened around the event so they can turn it against you. Make no mistake about what its purpose is. It is so they can use what you say against you. And if you say it differently in trial, they will make every effort to use that against you. It, and I, I think if there's an important point to take away about the purpose of deposition, it's that one. So there are some obligations as a witness, whether you are the witness being the claimant or you are an expert witness. And I, I, I will refer to the Chinese philosopher again, is that this is the most important first step after the care you provide is to, is to be prepared. Um, and I think there's a lot that goes into this, a great deal of it for us as physicians who provide care to patients and take it personally is that it's, um, you know, um, it, it, it becomes a, uh, an affront to our profession and our, uh, the essence of who we are. But regardless of that affront, the most important thing in all of this is to make sure that we are honest about what we did and what the outcome was and about the care we provided. I think this is very true whether you are the claimant in a lawsuit, you're, you're the one on trial, or even more importantly, you are the expert witness or someone else involved in a suit and providing care. So obviously, tell the truth, right? That's the obligation because this is a these depositions are given as quote sworn testimony, um, and I think you are also obligated to be fair in what you say and how you say it. Um, that's really, really, really important when you are providing quote expert testimony. Um, we'll talk a bit about expert um, in a second here. Uh, it's also really important when you're not directly involved in a lawsuit, but or peripherally involved in the care. Um, you have to be balanced and fair with what you say. So be truthful, be fair, be as accurate as you can based on your memory of the events, and then of course be prepared. Right? That's that's the message here. You have to you have to review what you did, review the relevant literature. Um, uh, and especially for those of us who are in neurosurgery um, and have had the habit over the years about writing about what we do, because if you don't go back and read all that you have written about, I'm going to make this up right now, all that you've written about hydrocephalus, I can promise you the plaintiff's attorney will search your name and pull out every hydrocephalus related article that you ever published. And they're going to ask you about it. So you have to be prepared. Um, this idea about uh, being an expert witness, um, I, I, this, I'll stress this, and, and, and I can't stress this one enough. And I, I, I don't know if Dr. Harris is with us today, but I, you know, Dr. Harris was part of the professional conduct committee of the AANS uh, for many years. And what I remember hearing from him, um, and from what I know from my own personal experience, is that most of the neurosurgeons who are sanctioned by our professional society for for, for behavior is because of the way they have testified against other neurosurgeons in an unbalanced or unreasonable way. Uh, and when you provide uh, expert witness testimony and you happen to be the expert at, uh, I'm going to make this up again now, you're the expert at, uh, at left trigeminal neuralgia. And the person who treated that patient didn't do exactly what you would do, but yet it's within the realm of reasonable practice and other people may do it. You can't be dogmatic about your personal philosophy for that management. That would be unreasonable and unbalanced. So when people get sanctioned by the professional conduct committee, most of it has to do with the way they give their professional testimony as an expert. If you give expert testimony that is codified in the deposition and can be subpoenaed uh, and when you get called up before a professional conduct committee, you are responsible for what you say in that deposition. So if you're in that situation, be fair, 
be balanced and be reasonable. Um, this idea of being prepared, I, I can't stress it enough, right? This is, this is my good friend and former colleague, David Sandberg. He showed up to work like this on more than one occasion. I, I, had to, I had to get a picture of it because he went through life with his hair on fire and his white coat flapping behind him because he was always, always, always in a hurry. And when you're in this situation, you cannot be in a hurry and you cannot be ill-prepared. I'll also take this opportunity to, to mention that when you show up to give a deposition, you need to look professional, right? And I, I know that sounds old fashioned in this day and age, um, but you, your deposition is frequently recorded, the audio is recorded, and uh, there is a video recording of it um, in most circumstances, particularly if you are testifying uh, to the care you provided and not directly uh, mentioned in the suit or if you're an expert. Um, so you're, you're visible on that, your, your body language is visible, the way you're dressed is visible, and you want to make sure that people see you as a professional. Now that means different things to different people, but if this it ends up in front of a jury of our peers, you know, there's going to be all kinds of people in that jury. So look professional. Um, a word about plaintiff's attorneys. Um, and I, and I think this is a lesson that, that if all of us stumble into it, we, uh, will learn the hard way. So the, the, the plaintiff in the case, uh, the person who is suing you for malpractice hires an attorney and they're the guys who advertise on buses, um, uh, and on park benches um, and on television uh, with the slip and fall thing. Um, no matter what you think of them um, on a personal level, they, uh, the ones who are successful uh, have a strategy to get you to give up your money. And the way they get to your money, whether it's yours personally because you're self-insured or your insurance company's money, um, is to get you to say what they want you to say in a deposition. And they have a bunch of strategies to do that. And um, they're, they kind of fit into these stereotypic patterns. And I'm not an expert on personality disorders, but these people fall into sort of patterns. Um, I think the most common one is the, is the, the overtly uh, complimentary um, an apologetic pattern where they start in with, oh, Dr. Ragab, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I've heard so much about you. Um, I know you've been in the community for so many years and I'm really sorry to take up your time with this. Um, and none of that is true. What they're trying to do is disarm you so that they can get you to say what they want you to say. And they'll use the common strategies of any negotiation to win favor and take advantage of the situation. And this quote here that you see from Sun Tzu uh, is indeed true, right? They are doing their best to get you to say something with which they can use against you in trial. So when you begin a deposition, I'm not suggesting that you be overtly suspicious of the plaintiff's attorney, but you need to be suspect of any of these platitudes and nonsense that they, that they this is about your testimony. So don't be fooled by their kindness and their, uh, their, their casual demeanor, their, their flattery. They'll, they'll play this game where th they'll ask a question that is essentially a yes or no answer and you'll say yes or no, and then there'll be this silence where they'll just stare at you. And what they're trying to do is make you uncomfortable so that you elaborate or start to equivocate or to qualify. So be aware of this and be concise and conscious of it as you do this. And when you give a deposition, um, there's a few basic rules about the testimony that you give. So. I put this one first, right? This one's first, um, and it's next to this other Sun Tzu quote, um, which is that um, we as teachers and part of the university faculty find ourselves always in a situation 
where we're trying to explain to other people what we know. And when you do that in a deposition and you are providing more than just answering the direct question that's being asked to you, you are giving additional information to the plaintiff's side. Now, I don't want to call them your adversary, but you are helping the other side. So when you're asked a direct question, you need to answer that direct question. You don't volunteer any more information and you don't embellish. And if they're about to say something wrong, that a medically incorrect fact or a physiologic error, um, you keep quiet. You let that go on the record so that they impugn themselves as opposed to you volunteering to help them. I can't stress the don't volunteer thing enough. Now, if you have a, sp a smart attorney who's with you, they'll interrupt you. And then there'll be this back and forth between the two attorneys. And I will point out that you need to be quiet when that happens. And I'll go on to embellish on that in a bit. So never volunteer information that isn't being asked directly of you in the question. When you answer their question, make sure you understand the question. Again, let them finish the question and listen carefully. Don't begin to answer until you've had a chance to think about the question carefully. So, you know, we being busy, um, driven, focused people are sometimes in the habit of like trying to think three steps ahead so we can get our day done and keep moving, right? And that's a mistake in the setting of a deposition. So make sure you understand the question and take time to think about it before you answer the question. And if you don't understand what they're asking you, make them repeat it. And I'm not suggesting you do that to frustrate them, but they will ask these long-winded situational type of questions where there isn't really a question, it's a protracted statement. And I would caution you about those kinds of questions because they're trying to get you to agree to something. So don't guess in that question, in that situation, ask them to repeat or rephrase the question. Um, it's okay to say that I don't remember. So uh, I gave a deposition about a case that I was involved in uh, 18 years ago. Um, uh, there was a lot of, I don't remember, right? It was, a, it was an overt effort on the plaintiff's attorney side of trying to rewrite history. And, um, you know, it's, it's also an example that no matter how many depositions I gave over the years, this guy aggravated me and I got angry and that was a mistake. But I, there was a lot of, I don't remember because it's been 18 years and I really don't remember the nuance of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you'll see people get terse and unpleasant. Um, I think that works against us. Um, you know, a bit of, some of us are known to be sarcastic, uh, myself included. Um, I learned from Dr. Morrison, who's the king of sarcasm. Um, and I, I, if, you, if you deteriorate into that kind of behavior, um, you're not gonna win. In addition, remember this is being recorded and you are gonna be perceived by the jury should it get to that point as not being the person who you probably want to be thought of as, right? So I would caution you about being difficult, um, impolite, sarcastic, angry. I think the other thing that's really important is that if you get angry and you, your adrenergic response is not going to help you be um, thoughtful, uh, and careful in your responses. It's gonna make you react instead of being thoughtful. So do not allow yourself to get angry. I, I cannot stress it enough. Um, the plaintiff's attorneys have this habit of interrupting you while you're in the middle of an answer. They may do that 
for many reasons. One, because they've decided that that, that question is going no place and they're disinterested. Two, they may be trying to stop you from answering a question in a certain way um, that isn't going to help their case. Three, they're trying to make you angry. And it's probably all three of those reasons. So if, you, if they interrupt you uh, in the midst of an answer, I would expect my attorney to object. And if they don't, then you need to sit quietly. And when they stop asking their next question, you go back and finish your answer. That will frustrate them, but it is always the right thing to do. So if they don't allow you to complete your thought, then you will do it the next time you offer the opportunity to speak. It's really, really important. So be sure that your entire thought is completed so that what you say isn't taken out of context and manipulated against you. Really important. You know, the, the whole, um, the way that, that, you know, we, you know, the way in modern politics and modern media that gets done all the time, right? But in a deposition, all of it is recorded. And if you don't have the opportunity to finish your thought, then you miss the opportunity to, to avoid being manipulated by having people take what you say out of context. Um, you know, you'll see this stuff on, on like the news where people say, may I speak off the record? There's nothing off the record here. If you need to speak to your attorney, then you ask for a break and you step outside the room and you talk to the attorney. The, the attorneys will say to each other, uh, stop the deposition. We will, we want to speak off the record. That's fine. But we the person involved in giving the deposition should not do that, in my opinion. If you have something to say, you need to say it outside the room in private with your attorney and you ask for a break. Um, and I think this be concise as the question calls for. This goes back to the very beginning where you should uh, limit how much teaching and volunteering of information you provide. I, I, you know, we, it's hard for us to resist that. We do it all day, every day with our students, our residents and fellows, and with the patients and families that we counsel about the care we provide. But when you're in a deposition, you only provide the information necessary to answer the question and to clarify the care you provided in a way that makes it clear they know what you were doing and why at the time. Um, here's another really, really important one. Whenever you give a deposition, there's this giant pile of information that's been collected in advance by the two sides involved in the case. So all of your records, plus all of the records from the hospital and every other person involved in the case will be in a folder in front of you. And I, I'm being old fashioned, right? It isn't in a big three ring binder like it used to be, but there will be documents that will be printed and in front of you. And the great example is they'll refer to your operative note and they'll say, Dr. Ragger, did you dictate this operative note? And the answer is, well, let me see the note. The plaintiff's attorney will wave it in front of you, but you don't really know what they have in front of you. So when they ask you to testify about a document, you make sure you hold the document in your hand, you take the time to read the document and you resist the urge to say without actually reviewing it that you agree with it. The other red flag is when you say, do you recognize so-and-so as an expert on blah, blah, blah? Well, you have to be honest about that and say, I don't know, depends on the topic which they're discussing and exactly what they're saying. So no matter how much respect I have for Dr. Morcos, I do occasionally disagree with him. So if they ask me, do I recognize Dr. Morcos as an authority on blah, blah, blah? I'm gonna say, well, sometimes I agree with Dr. Morcos and sometimes I don't. Um, I mentioned a couple of times about the people in a deposition and about how important it is to use your attorney um, and how important it is to have a good attorney. So this last deposition I gave uh, that was about a case from 18 years ago um, 
my attorney was doodling on his notes. He was literally drawing little curly cues. And I, he wasn't quite snoring, but utterly useless. So in spite of my being badgered by the plaintiff's attorney, he said nothing. So you, when you work with attorneys, you get to recognize um, what's a, who's good at what they do and who's not. Uh, and so I think it's important that you understand what their role is as they represent you in a deposition. So if you're being asked a misleading question or a leading question or a question that you should not be expected to ask. Great example is uh, you provide care uh, for a neurosurgical patient. They, they have an event in the ICU uh, and they ask you about the use of X, Y, or Z resuscitation medicine and you weren't part of the resuscitation. So they're going to ask you about the cardiac resuscitation and you're not an expert on cardiac resuscitation. You're a neurosurgeon, right? Although you may provide ICU care and know the basics. So your attorney should object to that because you're not an expert on cardiac care. And you may say, well, wait a minute. I do, I do ACLS. I know all about that kind of stuff. Your role is to be quiet and let your attorney object. They're objecting because they are the expert on the law. You're the expert on neurosurgery. And if your attorney begins to object to a question, you need to close your mouth and let them object. Now, they'll go at each other. The two attorneys will go at each other. Um, and you may then be obligated to answer the question, but it creates the opportunity to strike that from the deposition when they take that in front of a judge. And if your attorney's doing their job, then all of those get sort of quarantined until they're resolved with a judge and they won't make it into the ultimate deposition. So let your attorney object, listen to their objections. And this thing about being harassed, you know, like if you, if, if you feel you're being harassed and your attorney is not um, doing something about it, then you say, excuse me, I need to take a break. And you, they stop the deposition and you step outside with your attorney and you speak to them about the way you think you're being treated. Um, you know, we're not, we're, you know, we're not lawyers. This is not our domain. And we're obviously uncomfortable in that situation. And I think it's a mistake to allow them to use that discomfort against us. Um, so if you don't think you're being treated fairly and you don't see your attorney responding, stop, ask to step outside, go outside and say, is this normal? Is it not? What do I do? That's entirely within your purview. Um, it's obvious here. They'll try to ask you the same question over and over and over again in an effort to get you to say the wrong thing, right? It's a really common strategy. And of course, your attorney should object. And if they don't, then you're, it's reasonable to say, sir or ma'am, I already answered that question and here's my answer. The last sort of shameful strategy is to try to make it as uncomfortable as possible for you um, in an effort to get you to make mistakes. And this takes on all sorts of forms. I remember it's, you know, the, where they put you in a little tiny chair and, or they put you in a chair that's really big while they make you feel small. I mean, there's all this sort of games that they play. Um, so, you know, be aware of that. And if you feel uncomfortable and you're not sure why, ask to be excused, speak to your attorney. Um, uh, yeah, for those of you who don't have the book, go get it, right? Put it by your bedside. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I know nothing about the Taoist philosophy, but I think uh, there's a lot of life's lessons that are in this book. Um, you know, get yourself a copy. If you don't have one, let me know. I'll buy it for you. Maybe I should provide those instead of the pediatric neurosurgery textbook that nobody, nobody reads when I give them anymore. Um, uh, you know, a few closing thoughts because I'm almost out of time and I wanted to provide time for discussion. Um, I think when you uh, give a deposition, one of the most important things is to understand yourself. You need to know your, your, your weaknesses and strengths um, so that you 
they aren't used against you, right? And if you're a person who gets angry and they can make you angry, they are gonna use that against you. Um, I, I, there's, a, there's a rule in, in giving a deposition um, about medical malpractice and it's about the money. It's all about the money. And they'll say to you, doc, don't take this personally. It's just about the money. And it's true. And the irony of all of this is that there'll be this tense, uncomfortable uh, exchange that goes on for hours between yourself and the two attorneys on opposing sides. And then afterwards they get up and they act like they're best friends and they go out to lunch. And I, it, it makes me nauseated, but that's the reality. It's just about the money. And don't ever forget that because it's about your money. Um, to summarize, your best way to avoid this is don't get sued, right? Provide good care, be honest about what you can do and what you can't. Um, but in, no matter how good we are, the system is such that eventually you'll have bad outcomes and somebody's going to be upset about you and you're going to have a claim filed against you, regardless of whether you did anything wrong. Um, be honest about what you can do. Um, use the legal resources. You know, risk, there's a risk management department with uh, people who are there to help you. And when you get that summons in the mail, don't bury it in, under the pile of crap on your desk. Make sure it gets sent to risk management immediately. And, you know, this is important, right? So be prepared, um, know yourself, and practice, if need be, before you do this the first time. And even if it's the, the hundredth time, it's important to talk to your attorney about the deposition you're going to give before you start the deposition. I do that every single time. And never forget, it's about the money, your money, uh, not about the care you provided. So I'll stop there. Um, and I'm happy to take questions, uh, although we're out of time. And I want to thank Diego for switching the schedule so I could go first this morning. John, thank you so much. That was a, a phenomenal job. And there's probably at least 25 pearls uh, of, of knowledge in that um, lecture. I, and again, I think the most important of which is it is all about the money and, and not to take it personally. Uh, a couple of comments about that is that, uh, you know, in 2011, Jackson Memorial Hospital uh, was able to get sovereign immunity uh, from the state of Florida. And that has definitely impacted the number of lawsuits coming through uh, Jackson. Uh, in 2018, it was challenged um, and it was actually upheld by, by the, the Florida state uh, courts. And, and, and it is a really important issue because um, at the University of Miami, we don't hospital, we don't have sovereign immunity. And we basically have limitless pockets of money that could be obtained. So that influences uh, you know, plaintiffs attorneys in, in deciding to, to sue us as opposed to our community neurosurgeons, many who have no insurance. Uh, and th that is a factor in, in deciding uh, whether uh, cases uh, go forward. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to mention, and, and I was kind of astounded by this fact, is that you know, for the old people in the room, altering the medical record is obviously a complete no-no. And what we, what we think about altering the medical record is the physician going down to medical records, which doesn't exist anymore, taking some white out, and sort of, you know, whiting out some lines in their medical record. And obviously that doesn't even exist anymore, but it's incredible with the EMR that every single key that you hit uh, in, in, in someone's chart is recorded for eternity. Uh, and they can, they can fish that up very easily. And if, for example, you dictate an operative note and as, as you know, we always look at the operative note. We make corrections if some things are not correct. And they have that data. So if you decide, you know, you did it, dictated something in the operative report, and then at the end you said, well, you know, that's not really correct. I'm just going to hand dictate, you know, what happened. They will consider that, you know, not an alteration in the medical record, but they will have that knowledge that you, you changed it. 
So, you know, if you said the patient woke up fine and then the next day they didn't and you, you know, because you were anxious to write the note immediately after surgery and then the next day you, you write, well, you delete that comment, that, that can, that something as simple as that can come up and bite you. So just, just be very cognizant of, of, of the medical record and the access the, uh, the attorneys uh, have uh, to that. Again, great job, John. Thank you. It's time for me to retire because I, 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 it's more chilling every time I hear about it. It's just, yeah, be careful out there. John, John, quick question here, Mike Ivan. How much when you're when you're talking are you relied upon just your own personal experience versus knowing the literature and using you know uh, data that's already been published to kind of support your reasoning? Yeah, so that's a really important question, Mike. It depends on the circumstances around which you are giving the deposition. Right. So if you're giving a deposition as an expert witness, then you are you are uh, summarizing the body of literature um, as well as your personal experience uh, to support one side or the other. Um, and I like like many as I've done a lot of uh, work defending other neurosurgeons. Um, most of it, and it's a combination of the two. Right. Um, uh, the gray hair and the gray beard helps when I'm trying to help other people who are being sued. Um, when you are testifying to the care you are providing, you can use that. But as we all know, the body of literature will support nearly any position and the journal of unreproducible facts will be brought up against you if you start to do too much of that. So I, I think my caution is that you have to use some balance. Um, you justify what you do based on your training, the consensus of the literature, um, and your experience. And I'd, I'd be interested to know what the other senior faculty say, but it, it is a combination of all of the above, but there is a caveat in relying on the literature because the plaintiff's attorney is going to find that other useless paper, you know, that I published that says the opposite. Dr. Green usually has strong feelings about giving depositions. I don't know if he's around today. Um, he's probably has more experience than all of us put together. No, I, I appreciate your talk and I, um, I purposely avoid um, getting involved in uh, litigation because the extraordinary emotional toll and logistic toll and and in consequences, but I think that what you said, you know, during this last hour was extraordinarily important and people, I hope, pay attention to it. But I think the less you educate the attorneys and the more you simplify your responses, and I think the more you try not to preach and uh, the more you just be very brief and, and abrupt and, and know your know the literature, but I wouldn't educate them. I wouldn't teach them. I wouldn't present the literature. Um, and again, uh, you'll always find people that will come up with the contrary. So it's very difficult. My own mentor, Paul Busey, at the end of his career, uh, began to uh, testify against doctors about surgeries he never performed. He never saw an ACDF, but he would testify against them uh, at the end of towards the end of his life, and it was totally inappropriate and 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 disheartening to all of us who trained under him and respected him. So integrity is very important and credibility. So that's that's the bottom line. Yeah, it, it, your, the, Dr. Green's point about the you know not teaching the the plaintiff's attorney what they don't know. I mean, we, it's, we have to resist that urge to educate and it's hard for us. I mean, it's just not what we do. Well, thanks again for the opportunity. I, I hope none of you ever have to use this information, but, uh, but in, be prepared. Thank you. So, um, so most of you know me, I'm Diego. I, um, I'm the Jackson South fellow. And as uh, many of you already know, before starting my clinical work here, uh, prior to coming here, I was a postdoc at the uh, Brain Tumor Center at UCSF with Dr. Hideo Okada in his lab for brain tumor immunotherapy. Hence the, uh, um, the, the logos and everything. 
Um, today, I'd like to show you how we used immunopeptidomics to select peptide targets based on their expression profiles to develop T cell receptors to treat gliomas. I know that the term immunopeptidomics may sound a little bit or somewhat fancy, but hopefully throughout this presentation, we'll get there and uh, you'll realize that it's very feasible and effective uh, way to develop the new wave of biological therapies for gliomas. Uh, I don't have any financial relationships to this close. This is the agenda uh, of the topics we'll cover today. Uh, we'll start with some generalities uh, by covering uh, a very exciting subject, which is uh, some basic concepts in immunology. Next, uh, we'll talk about the challenges of brain tumor immunotherapy and to continue with uh, different types of approaches that have been developed in the immunotherapy field. And finally, to get to the main, into the main subject of my talk, uh, the background that motivated my project. Next, uh, we'll talk how we selected our targets based on our bioinformatics pipeline, and then uh, through protein validation. And finally, the most interesting part to me at least, uh, how we developed our T cell receptors. Um, so as we move forward, uh, these are some, uh, some of the concepts in immunology that provide the basis for our project. This is the cell, uh, this is a cytosol, very basic. So first we have uh, cytosolic proteins that are constantly getting cleaved by proteases into smaller peptides. Um, these peptides then travel, these are the uh, proteins being cleaved into peptides, and these peptides then travel to the endoplasmic reticulum uh, and bind the major histocompatibility complex or MHC based on their structural features. This is a very important uh, part of this. It's on structural features rather than mutational status. So what is the MHC? Uh, it, long story short, it's basically an adapter that uh, once bound to the uh, peptide will ship the peptide to the cell surface to get presented to the immune system, which is what we see here. So as we said before, if this binding is not dependent on the mutational status, but rather on structural, that is uh, physical and chemical features such as pH uh, or uh, electric charges, then that actually means that there are non-mutated peptides that are constantly being presented to the immune system. Uh, but what happens is that early in development, those T cells that react against non-mutated cell antigens get energized or eliminated in the thymus. Um, so we also know that some cancers upregulate uh, normal proteins, non-mutated proteins that are normally turned off in normal tissues. So we wondered if by looking or if, if we cleave this MHC molecule from uh, the cell membrane, and we then separate the peptide that it's on, on this adapter, and we somehow typify or sequence the, those peptides, um, we could potentially find a whole immunopeptidome, hence the name of the project, uh, that we would be able to target through cell-based therapies. Um, so that is the question that motivated this, this, uh, this project. Are there any glioma-specific and characterizable targets that we can use to develop new T cell-based therapies? So uh, let's step back a little bit and talk about the uh, challenges uh, of immunotherapy for brain tumors. Let's talk about, it, uh, about immunotherapy in general to begin with. Um, the field has been around since the 1990s, and uh, with the discovery of CTLA-4 and PDL-1 as immune modulators uh, by Allison in Berkeley, uh, whose work actually earned him the Nobel Prize in 2018. But uh, lately, in the past five to 10 years, uh, 
the uh, field of immunotherapy has gotten uh, a lot of hype with the development of immune checkpoint blockade and uh, showing that it works. But as you know, space is the final frontier in Star Trek. I like to think that uh, primary CNS tumors are the final frontier for immunotherapy because there are many challenges that need to be addressed. The first one, uh, this is a fairly old concept that uh, has been recently challenged, um, is the immune privilege of the brain. It was thought initially that uh, the immune system does not enter the brain, but as the lymphatic system microvasculature of the brain has been recently described, we know now that immune cells, for example, T cells or macrophages among others, uh, freely transit in and out of the brain, patrolling the whole brain parenchyma. So this is even more true or uh, happens even more when the blood brain barrier is disrupted in the setting of tumors. So even though it is considered a challenge, um, in some of the scenarios, it even facilitates the entry of immune cells into the tumor tissue. But then let's say we have our T cells that come in and out of the tumor doing their normal, their normal thing. So then we have the, this, let's talk about T cells, for example, uh, they find tumor microenvironment. So again, we have competent immune cells traveling, patrolling in and out of the CNS, and they find a tumor and they decide to go in and, you know, to see what's going on. And what it finds is a microenvironment of immunosuppressive cytokines and metabolites that will make it extremely hard to mount an effective response on site. Furthermore, it will uh, actually exhaust and even energize uh, the immune cells. That way the tumor manages to dampen any attempt of the immune system to counteract its growth, which makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. Third, let's say that our T cells are able to get into the brain, they're able to get into the tumor, survive its toxic environment, and yet it is highly unlikely that our T cell will find an antigen to react against. Why? Basically because even though it's been described with gliomas, especially high grades, have a somewhat uh, above average mutational load, the chances that these mutations will actually translate into an actual neoantigen um, that can get recognized by the immune system is extremely low. So even though this does not necessarily apply to adoptive cell transfers or um, uh, CAR T cells, but uh, let's talk about, for example, EGFRV3. Only up to 30% of the cells in the glioma uh, have been uh, reported to be EGFRV3 positive. And once you wipe them out, the tumor continues to grow. Uh, of course, without any GFRV3 positive cells. Therefore, we need more targets. But looking at uh, neoantigens uh, may not yield the results we expect. Another example of this is, for example, the uh, temozolomide treated gliomas, that even though they yield a very, an extremely high number of mutations, hence why they're called hypermutators. Uh, the, yield, the, the yield of neoantigens is extremely low, um, as it's been uh, recently shown in a paper by, by Joe Costello, also from the Brain Tumor Center of UCSF. So this is also a challenge. Uh, in summary, basically the, the targetable proteins that finally get translated from all the mutations, which is very low. And finally, uh, epigenetic events. Uh, uh, the ones, for example, are caused by the IDH mutation. Um, they, uh, for example, in, in the setting of IDH, they uh, lead to a myriad of uh, metabolic events that ultimately inhibit, inhibit the migration of the immune cells into the tumor microenvironment. This four, this, uh, uh, four bullets uh, were extracted from a very nice uh, review that uh, John Sampson and Peter Fecci published last year in Nature. So, um, it's, it's published. Um, just some examples. For example, we're talking about mutational load. This paper by Lawrence um, 
puts into perspective the mutational load of low grades and high grades that are highlighted uh, in yellow and compares them to uh, other tumor types. We see, for example, that low grades have a very low mutational load uh, below average. And even though GBMs have a higher yield, they fall into this kind of gray area, which is not either high or low. So it's still not that good. Uh, connecting this with the prior slide, uh, we show that the yield of actual neoantigens, or we kind of infer that the yield of actual neoantigens from these mutations should be even lower. Then uh, another example of epigenetic factors. This is another. Um, this is a, this was another paper that uh, was published from Dr. Okada's lab, in which we showed that uh, IDH mutant gliomas inhibit the accumulation of TCD8 cells, not just by the inherent toxic effect of 2HG, which is the oncometabolite of the mutated IDH gene that has direct toxicity on T cells, and we proved that in vitro. But um, then uh, through a series of downstream epigenetic events that downregulate all the genes that promote immune infiltration and taxes. So I also believe uh, Joe Costello and uh, Burhak have some very interesting work in this matter about all the epigenetic uh, uh, factors that come into play. So this is a brief summary of all the challenges for which immunotherapy modalities were different, different modalities were developed. Um, we first um, have CAR T cells, which is uh, basically an antibody uh, linked to a T cell. And when the antibody meets its antigen, it engages the cytolytic machinery of the T cell. Very straightforward. The next one is uh, adoptive cell transfers, uh, in which we harvest cells from the patient, uh, throw some tumor lysate into the cell culture and expand whatever expands in the media. And then through uh, a, a, a pipeline, we harvest those activated cells that are then purified and then transfused back into the patient. A variant of this approach is where my project falls into, uh, where we transduce, we, we harvest naive T cells from the patient. We transduce them using a TCR construct using a viral vector, and then we expand those cells, and then we retransfuse them back into the patient. Um, another approach, very popular nowadays, vaccines. Uh, there are currently many ongoing clinical trials using vaccines against wind tumors. Um, I won't talk much about that. And uh, finally, the reason why, again, as I mentioned before, the, the reason why the field got so popular some years ago is uh, the immune checkpoint blockade. Um, being the most popular is uh, uh, blockade against PD-1, PD-L1, CTLA-4. Uh, a new one uh, was uh, at that time TIM-3. So basically this molecules work as uh, breaks for the immune system. And by targeting them, we release the breaks, uh, making the immune system active against tumors in the brain. Um, kind of going back to the subject of brain to, of uh, tumor microenvironment, it's been shown, for example, that besides all the cytokines and metabolites that are toxic to the immune system, um, tumor cells and uh, regula regulatory uh, macrophages among others, actually express the ligands of these breaks. So on top of that, on top of the inherent toxicity of the tumor microenvironment, you have that uh, uh, immune cells going into the tumor and being energized directly by uh, uh, these ligands. So um, again, uh, immune checkpoint blockade or immune checkpoint inhibitors um, basically uh, convert these surface molecules, kind of cap them before the, the cells going, the immune cells going to the brain tumor so that they can stay active for a longer time. And they have shown to have really good results, but in brain mess, um, such as melanoma, uh, lung metastasis, and among others, but none, they have not shown uh, very promising results uh, 
on primary CNS tumors, unfortunately, or at least not as robust as seen on other uh, tumor types. So, um, a short background on uh, what motivated my project. Um, you probably all know this, according to TCGA, uh, the survival of patients with IDH mutant uh, gliomas ranges from 6.4 years in the case of astros up to eight years in the case of oligos. Um, this, for example, uh, this uh, being the main safe treatment of uh, radiotherapy plus uh, timozolomide in uh, GBMs, the survival is from 12 to 15 months. And even though it's, it's a great step forward, 15 months is not enough. So, uh, but then even, even if a patient, for example, in, in the case of uh, low grades, uh, makes it to the, uh, to the point of surviving eight years, uh, almost all these tumors, if resected, they will recur uh, undergoing malignant transformation. So giving these patients a very poor prognosis. Um, and beyond the immune checkpoint blockade, uh, immunotherapy is getting more and more attention as a powerful approach in cancer, especially when we think about cell-based therapies, which we've been talking about. Um, in this setting, we should also think, of, I mean, every, every time we talk about cell-based therapies, uh, either uh, adoptive cell transfers or R T cells, we should always think about antigens and targets, antigens and targets. So we have here um, a, a set of three bullets that we consider uh, as the ideal antigen checklist. Um, the first one is that its expression should be specific to the tumor site and not elsewhere in the body to avoid any off-target events. You see, the aim of our of what we develop is to be administered systemically uh, so we want to make sure that our T cells before uh, arriving to the brain tumor won't make any stops uh, outside of the brain, outside of the tumor and get activated. And that has been shown uh, as a side effect on, or a adverse effect on very early clinical trials from uh, when this first uh, cell therapies were being uh, developed. Um, in our case, because we're looking at T cells, we want whatever target that, again, we target, whatever antigen that we target, that engage, it engages the immune system robustly, uh, which basically translates into uh, the, uh, uh, that it pumps up all these uh, acute phase uh, reactants uh, that will further bring more T cells into the tumor site to kind of go into this positive uh, feedback loop that amplifies the immune, the immune response at the tumor site. And finally, uh, it should have a critical role in the oncogenic behavior of the tumor. Again, uh, if we target uh, a, a molecule that even though may be on the surface, uh, may get presented to the immune system, but yet it's not critical to the survival of the cell, uh, we, we won't achieve the lytic effect that we're looking for. So if, and again, this is an ideal antigen checklist. So it should, it should uh, have all these three items. So with this concept in mind, uh, we saw that currently there aren't many targetable antigens in glioma, especially when we place close attention to uh, intratumoral heterogeneity and intrapatient heterogeneity, that is, let's say intratumoral, not all the cells within a tumor express a certain antigen as we have many lineages uh, of cells uh, comprising the same tumor that arise from different uh, mutations at different stages of uh, the timeline of the tumor. And then even though in between patients, they might share uh, the same type of tumor, the same histology, the same molecular type of tumor may share many of uh, the features. Um, there are many, many um, mutations that are not shared in between patients. Um, that's what it means between the private versus shared repository of mutations that we can target. So um, with 
um, what we can see with uh, most with most new antigen discovery pipelines, uh, we would like to uh, develop highly personalized T cell therapies, and that is a very challenging endeavor. So let's talk a little bit about the methods. This um, project started in collaboration with Emadix, which is a German company that uh, leads the CAPVAC initiative. Um, again, uh, as you see there, it's a glioma actively personalized vaccine consortium. It's a whole, just briefly, it's this whole logistics going from a diagnosis all the way to uh, the translational part of development of personalized vaccines for the, the patients after, even after the patient uh, leaves the OR. So uh, this led to a publication um, uh, in Nature earlier uh, in 2019, in which they show a set of peptide sequences that they isolated from the MHC molecule obtained from primary GVM cells. If you remember one of the first uh, graphs that uh, I showed, basically we wanted to look at that uh, repertoire or pool of peptides that were stripped from the MHC molecule. So that's what they did. They lysed the uh, primary GVM, they uh, cleaved the uh, pro, uh, peptide MHC complex, they run uh, high potency liquid chromatography and then did mass spectrometry to get the uh, amino acid sequences from those peptides. Um, the result was a set of 64 non-mutated peptides, which we see here, um, that were restricted to HLA, A2, and A24, uh, which are, uh, long story short, they're just subclasses of the human MHC. Um, human, uh, these subclasses are very relevant, for instance, in um, uh, transplant or organ donation and transplantation. And they become really, really important when, when we talk about immunotherapy, especially in the setting of uh, adoptive cell transfers. So having this, uh, we wanted to select those uh, peptides that were specific to glioma tissue and were absent in normal organs to later the T cell receptors that uh, we were talking about. So with this set of peptides, we uh, started selecting them based on our pipeline. First, uh, as we see here on the top of our pipeline, um, we looked at single cell RNA seq data set that was published by Quake at Stanford that uh, looked into cortical neurons. This provided a very high resolution and allowed us to narrow down our candidates from 64 to eight. But the problem is that it only allowed us to look at the expression of our candidates in the cortex, uh, which is why we went to the next step in our pipeline. Uh, we used a data set from the Allen Institute of Brain Sciences to look at the expression of the remaining candidates throughout the rest of the brain, bringing our pool of candidates from eight to four. Finally, because again, we were thinking or we were projecting this uh, in, uh, therapy to be administered systemically, um, we were interested in looking at the expression of our candidates throughout the rest of the body. And for this, we used the GTEx database, which has uh, just been around for quite some time, and they have really good uh, big data uh, resources for this kind of bioinformatic pipelines. And they've been validated through many, many, many uh, experiments. And um, we further narrowed our selection from four to three. This analysis were done using normal tissues, but there was no available data set comparing normal tissues versus tumors. So we validated our selection by running qPCR and immunohistochemistry in a cohort of uh, primary and recurrent glioma cases that were paired from the same patients, um, along with normal cortex samples. Once uh, the result of this was the selection of these three candidates that we see here on the right, uh, RAD54B, TAXI3, and ASBM. And the, the goal after this was to move or go back to the bench and develop the TCRs or um, raise a new population of TCRs and sequence those TCRs using single cell uh, sequencing technologies to later, once we have those uh, constructs 
uh, transduce naive T cells from a patient to retransfuse them back once we know uh, what, uh, what kind of tumor they have and what kind of antigens they express. So the first candidate, and this is this is our our, validity, our um, expression profile that we used uh, in order to select the candidates. We have sixty four of these profiles. I'm just going to show them. I'm just going to show uh, four of them, three for the candidates that we chose, and one to show them to show you guys how it didn't work for one of the candidates. And um, we selected um, this first. Uh, peptide by 54B, which is involved in DNA repair and recombination. First, as we look at the expression here uh, in single cell um, RNA-seq in cortical neurons, uh, we see that its expression falls in the lower quartiles in less than 20% of the sequenced cells. When we look at the subcortical structures here uh, on the right, um, at different developmental stages, we see that its expression falls under the threshold of one log two RPK, which is uh, the, the standard unit of measurement for, for to this uh, RNA seq data. Um, especially during adulthood, in, uh, what we see here in the green in the green box. So, if our candidates fell into this green box, that meant they were a good candidate according to the thresholds that we determined. Um, and finally, we looked at the expression on peripheral organs, also by RNA-seq. And uh, we found that the exon encoding for our peptic candidate showed as non-applicable, as we see all here in the, uh, um, uh, in gray, in the gray boxes. Uh, so we thought this might have something to do with the annotations. Uh, but nonetheless, as we can see here, its level of expression was very extremely low. Um, in regards to its biology, uh, to understand what we were targeting, um, RAD54 is a molecule from a family of DNA recombinases, which is an enzyme that repairs DNA after double-stranded damage, like the one you get when your tumor gets radiated. So on the right, we see a heat map showing that uh, brain tumor patients with high expression of RAD54B, among other uh, sets of genes, uh, presented poor outcomes. So we decided to see if this was applicable in the lab, and uh, we used two tumor-derived cell lines that are available commercially and uh, run this uh, experiment in which we striped the um, MHC with a peptide and sent it for mass spectrometry. And um, we, we, we found that the, the, the peptide that belongs to RAD54B that we wanted to target is upregulated after our uh, tumor cell lines were radiated, therefore opening the door for another line of treatment for gliomas after radiation and temozolomide, which also caused this uh, double-stranded DNA disruption. This, of course, needs in vivo validations, and um, as I'll show later, but um, works as a proof of concept to understand the biology of our first selected candidate. Uh, we're currently working, oh, they are currently working in the lab to uh, get this in vivo validation. Um, then um, the validation that we spoke about, after identifying RAD54B as a good target, uh, we, want, and we went on and validated its, its expression using our in-house set of paired tumor samples that the Brain Tumor Center had. Basically, they, they've been following patients for so long that they have um, uh, samples of tissue uh, from the uh, initial tumor and from its recurrence coming from the same patient, which is extremely valuable. Uh, so, uh, yes? Sorry to interrupt. Do, uh, the normal brain samples you're using, are they from the same patient or are they from a uh, database? It's a database. That's a great question. Uh, it's not, well, I call it here non-tumor because it's not normal tumor. We, for, for our qPCR experiment, we included normal tumor, but for uh, the TMAs and, and immunohistochemistry, we used glial tissue that we got from uh, epilepsy um, surgeries. So even though not ideal, that's as close as we could get to normal tissue. 
But no, the normal tumor or uh, the normal tissue or non-tumor did not belong to the same patient. Um, so first, uh, on the left, we see the qPCR, that in normal brain, there's a complete absence of expression in normal brain. Um, and it increases as the tumor recurs. We find the same observation at a protein level uh, using IHC. And we further quantified that using uh, this test, the H score on the right, showing significant increase, especially at recurrence. So we have this uh, target validated. And we move forward to the next uh, target, which is taxi 3 This is our second candidate. And it's a protein that is involved in uh, mitotic processes. Right. Single cell RNA seq again up here on the left. Uh, it's almost off, as we can see by the level of expression, and almost no cells in the cortex express this gene. As we already know, that most uh, uh, cells in the brain that are uh, uh, either neurons or glial, they do not, uh, they're somehow hyacinth, so we would not expect them to uh, be actively cyclin. So in normal tissue, that is. Then we look at subcortical structures and it shows a relative high expression early in development when uh, all those um, primordial structures are actively dividing. And then it comes down by the time the, uh, the brain reaches adulthood. Um, finally, when we looked at the expression on peripheral organs down here, we see that it is mildly expressed in the in whole blood and in the testes. But when we look at the raw data, even though it's not completely off, the level of expression is within what we consider to be within a safe range. So as you can see, the color matches an approximate value of three, which in uh, terms of RNA-seq is not that much. Whereas other genes that uh, we had to drop went all the way up to 63, as you can see uh, on the scale on the lower part of the panel. Um, let's move to the ASPM expression profile. Um, the protein, this is a protein that is involved in asymmetric cell division and stabilization of the uh, mitotic spindle. And uh, there were uh, some papers coming out when uh, uh, the Zika virus was popular and uh, causing or being associated with microcephaly. And um, it was because of, of how it involved ASPM. Um, so in all the three assessments, uh, it showed us that as, as an excellent candidate, uh, as the expression levels were almost zero, as we can see here. So then when we looked, um, we looked at the uh, at one of the meetings with our bioinformatician, Soren, uh, we started looking at some data sets that were generated there at UCSF. And uh, this is a TISNI for those who are, uh, this is a TISNI of a tumor case of UCSF. And for those who are not very familiar with it, a TISNI is basically a two-dimensional reduction of a multi-dimensional single cell analysis. Long story short, each dot is a cell that was sequenced and all the cells that are grouped are, are grouped based on the similarity of their expression profiles. Therefore, assuming if they're, that if they're close, uh, they belong to the same population, forming clumps or clusters of cells. So first, we wanted to see in, in this uh, primary GBM, uh, which cells expressed KI67, which we know it's a marker of proliferation of cells or, or cells that are actively cycling. And we found that, that those same clusters that light up for KI67 also light up for ASPM and taxi 3 which makes sense from our understanding of its biology. But then we wanted to further understand what kind of populations were this. So uh, using a bioinformatics pipeline uh, by the Mario Suva group from Harvard, we looked at a single cell database for low-grade gliomas and looked at uh, cell cycle markers or programs, that's how the algorithm calls it, to identify in which stage of the cell cycle the cell was, or all the, each cell type was. And um, in this two principal component analysis, um, we see that uh, we see many different populations, but let's focus on the empty triangles for both, which are positive for our markers of interest. 
And we see that almost half of these cells that are actively cycling are uh, either taxi 3 or ASPN positive, further confirming our initial observation. Um, I like this chart very much because, because uh, I call it the flux capacitor. From that same um, uh, pipeline, uh, besides cycling, we wanted to understand what these cells were, uh, were doing, actually. So this, this is also a principal component uh, diagram that shows the stemness of the cells analyzed based on their programs or the uh, expression programs. And in the middle, in the middle, we see, uh, a, so if it's not, if it doesn't go or commit into an astrocytic or astro-like differentiation or oligo-like differentiation, it is assumed that it's a stem cell, which is also graded here on the y-axis. So um, we see that most of the cells that are cycling that are positive for either taxi three or ASPM have a stem cell-like program. So we thought that by targeting these molecules, in theory, we would be targeting glioma stem cells, which is very interesting. This is the validation that we run, um, again, in our paired samples. And we see that for taxi 3 both uh, by qPCR and IHC, the expression is absent in non-tumor tissue and it increases as the tumor recurs. Finally, for ASPM, uh, we were not able to verify this at a, uh, we were only able to verify the transcript level showing that it increases. Um, but unfortunately at the time there were no um, antibodies that we could use for IHC. So that is still pending. Finally, to conclude our assessment, I know this chart must be, this diagram must, might be a little bit overwhelming, but uh, it's, it's very, very straightforward. Uh, we looked at the peptide presentation profiles of our candidates using mass spectrometry. This was uh, data provided to us by Edmatics in Germany that led the GAPVAC initiative, right? So um, this, this was done on GBM and healthy tissues, as we can see in green to the left and GBM on, red, on the uh, uh, right. And um, we see that the median signal intensity for all of our candidates is higher in GBM than in normal tissue, meaning that they get presented by tumor cells and are not very frequently presented by normal cells. What we see here in green data um, is that is present in normal tissues. Is pro they're probably the cycling cells in epithelial surfaces corresponding to taxi 3 and ASPM. As we see, they're just circles and triangles, but not diamonds. So rat 54 b is completely absent in normal tissue, that is. Uh, this is just an example of a candidate that had to be dropped because of its really poor uh, expression profile. We see that it's present in the brain throughout different stages of development throughout the rest of the body, and it's presented here in the bottom by many, many types of tissue, especially the brain. So it was no bueno. Um, so uh, this is where the magic happened. Having selected the peptide candidates that we wanted to target, we stimulated healthy donor uh, peripheral uh, blood uh, mononuclear cells, PBMCs, using established protocols over uh, four weeks from healthy donors. Um, and uh, we isolated the uh, reactive T cell population against RAT54B. Basically, we dropped the peptide, we incubated them for four weeks, and then using uh, tetramer and dextramer staining, uh, we uh, sorted them and isolated the reactive cells. Um, we then used the ones that had the highest affinity, showed here in red, and we sent it for single cell sequencing of the TCR using the 10X genomics platform. Um, and we found that this population was predominantly clonal. Uh, that data is not shown. Here on the left side, we see, we wanted to know if this population was actually reactive. As we said, the ideal, initially on the checklist, the ideal 
um, candidate should be the one that is able to engage the immune system robustly. So one of the ways of assessing that is by doing an ELISA for interferon gamma. So we see that our expanded T cell population is highly specific against our peptide of interest, RAP54B, and uh, which is not the case when we stimulated those same cells with irrelevant peptide or not peptide at all, as we can see here. Um, just uh, for your information, OKT3 and media alone were the positive and negative controls respectively. So they're just, you know, the scales and how high it can go. But we see that it's reactive. Um, this is another, uh, this is another assay, immunoassay called the Ellie spot, in which it's basically a membrane that re reacts against interferon gamma. Every spot is a cell reacting, uh, which is a very important cytokine, interferon gamma, for CD8 T cells uh, when they carry out uh, cytolytic functions. So we see that our cells start reacting at a fairly low amount, uh, and also that this reaction is very peptide specific, as we can see with the other controls. And later on, uh, and this is work that has continued to happen uh, once I left the lab. Uh, this is the most uh, recent work that they've done. Um, they, uh, after we obtained the sequences from uh, the uh, 10X platform, the sequences of the variable regions of our TCRs, um, as we saw a couple of slides ago, we sent this sequence to a company in Japan called Takara, and they used their patented viral vector technology to transduce T cells with our TCR construct while inhibiting the expression of the endogenous TCR to avoid mispairing. So when we run full cytometry, uh, we first isolate the cells that are transduced with the TCR as we see here in this first panel. And then we run further functional cytometric analysis as we see in the middle, and we see that it's specific and functional. Uh, as we can see here on the top left diagram, uh, on the upper left uh, quadrant. Um, and we run the same assay that we run uh, with the peptide initially uh, required to engage the immune system, you know, the interferon gamma one. And uh, we, the results were really promising as the concentration of peptide required to engage uh, a cytolytic response from them was very, very low. So uh, right now, now that we have the construct and we, sh we have shown that it's specific and that it's very, very uh, strong when it reacts against our peptide, we're moving to animal uh, models to show its efficacy. Um, and that's the current state of uh, our work right now. So we show the three antigen epitopes derived from RAP54B, TAC-C3, and ASPM that are exclusively expressed and presented by the immune system, uh, by the immune system to the immune system by gliomas. Their expression is, has been shown to be higher in recurrent tumors without very significant levels measured in normal brain and peripheral organs, further making uh, room for this uh, cell-based therapy alongside with the mainstay of therapy, that is in between the primary and the recurrence, we can add this therapy uh, when the tumor is getting irradiated and uh, treated with temozolomide. We suggest that RAD54B and TAXI3 as well as ASPM are suitable targets to develop T-cell-based therapies as we showed with RAD54B. Um, we developed the TCR and we think that this method can be useful for the assessment of uh, other epitopes derived from normal proteins in the context of immunotherapy, especially for brain tumors. Um, we are on the ver uh, we're actively um, moving to animal models. And one project that unfortunately I wasn't able to carry out very like, much further than, than initial trials. Um, or initial attempts to get it working is uh, streamlining the development of reactive T cells or HSCs, which we obtained from umbilical cord. That is obtaining not even naive T cells, but uh, higher up or higher undifferentiated T cells to uh, make it much easier to uh, engage or raise a whole population of reactive T cells 
against self antigens, kind of bypassing the energy that happens in the thymus by recreating all this development of T cells in vitro. Um, the people that we worked with while at the Brain Tumor Center. Um, any questions? Thank you everyone for your attention. I uh, really hope this was interesting to you all. I really want to give special thanks to Dr. Landy for accommodating this time with such a notice. This is pretty much it. Thank you.